The Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. Today's episode is sponsored by JFM Enterprises, providing distinctive ready-made and custom frames and moldings to the trade since 1974. Visit jfm.net to view their catalog of designs. Are you at the Avalon Theater building? We're in the basement. Yep. We're in the yeah. MCTV in the basement. Okay. Um, so, and um, we've got the Glenn Miller Orchestra playing this evening upstairs. So they might come in and do a little march by the band. You may see them marching in the background. Oh, that may happen. Yeah. A lot of stuff goes on here, Neil. Yeah, I'm sure. It's a very, it's a, it's a very, it's a very crazy and wild time. It's almost here. like being a painter with all the things you have to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Plenary Eastern Podcast, everyone. Jess, we're getting ready to start another episode here. Can you believe it? They're still making us do this. Yep. It's in, unbelievable. In masks and everything. I know. We're, we're in masks because I'm afraid that um, Tim has cooties. That's really Cooties why. are bad this year. Cooties, well, if you think COVID's bad, cooties are terrible. I, I If you get the, the cootie shot, it's just a circle, circle, dot, dot. Then you have the cootie shot. We um, got to talk to Neil Hughes today, and I think that he is just truly one of the great painters that has been at Plenar Easton and yeah I was gonna say pro and he's like a painter's painter he, he um, and as he says in the interview here once once it's not fun for him anymore he'll stop doing it but he loves what he does well and again he's so incredibly like driven and pra- pragmatic about it he doesn't to me have like the personality of a stereotypical artist he's not like flighty or you know that, that, <laughs> wait not that artists are flighty I don't know Listen, but like he's so he's so that's like nothing against all you stereotypical artists oh out there oh my gosh so I'm the know. worst and and you will learn a little bit that um Tim has way more sports trivia in his brain than you might than guess. Jess does yeah oh, well I have zero so there is not um it's a pretty low standard Tim um I hope you enjoy this podcast thanks for listening here we go uh, Neil welcome to the show hello thank you Nice to be here. I'm so happy. I'm so happy to be here with Neil. He, I, Neil, at this point feels like family to me. I feel like yeah, he's um, almost like the old codger. <laughs> he's like, you know, he's like, he's like been here. I mean, Neil, yeah. Neil, how when, when how long have you been coming to Plein Air Easton? It's been a while. Uh, I think the first time I did it, uh, if I'm not mistaken, was 2012, maybe. That yeah. sounds about right. That sounds that's about almost right. ten years. We could look yeah. it up. Yeah, yeah. no. Um, I, so. I remember, I think it was the first time I met you, we sat and picked crabs together. Yes, you're good at that, <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> I am, it's one, of, it's one of my many hidden talents, yes. if people are wondering what I'm good at. Um, when did you feel like you knew that you were an artist? Were you a kid who always was painting and drawing, or is it something that you kind of was felt a calling to later? Like, tell me about Neil as a kid. All right, well, Neil as a kid, I was one of 11 children. Stop it. Yes. And uh, my mother always referred to me as the artist of the family. Even wow. When I was you know, a young child because they saw that I, I liked art. I took uh, art lessons when I was maybe in fourth grade, something like that. Um, but I didn't really think I was going to go into it um, uh, later on. And then... Um, I was taking workshops and things just for fun, and then I ended up uh, enrolling uh, at the Philadelphia College of Art, and uh, that was that was that. I I was a uh, I majored in illustration, and I was an illustrator for quite a few years before I just started doing just fine art. But that, like, what? Tell me more about that transition because you, well, people I mean, just don't really take like you don't you just really don't take workshops like yeah. you must have felt like you were good at it or you felt um I just, excited yeah, by I mean, it i just or... like doing it um when i first but i mean i think neil what you had said was you said uh i was never really thinking about doing it taking it up for a career and then your next sentence was but then before i knew well, it, i was yeah. taking classes well, okay. so, I mean, how... let me back up a little bit 
when I graduated high school, I went to a community college for a year and just took liberal arts. And I just thought, you know, this like it was, it was one of those. It was one of those. OK, I got to figure out what I'm going to do years. Yeah, kind, you, of, you... kind of like that. And I thought this is like being back in high school. So I ended up quitting. Um, well, I, I did a whole year and then I uh, ended up working in construction and stuff. And that's what I was doing. And I but I, I always liked art and I I was painting on my own just for fun. Um, although at that time, I really I, I thought artists don't make any money. You know, it's a it's a dumb way to make a living and that kind of thing. That all turned out to be true, by the way. But um, <laughs> <laughs> when you were when you were painting again, I think that that is just such a like I love I love artists when they casually are like, oh, yeah, I was out of high school and I was just like painting for fun. Yeah. Like, tell me what you were painting. I, tell I me what the doing, Neil Hughes of high school was painting. Yeah, I was doing watercolors. Uh -huh. Landscape, plain air, watercolors. Wow! Basically, that's what I was doing. You know, some inside. I had um, a little area in our apartment where I would do it. You know, and uh, but I was doing sort of a wet on wet style, and I really loved watercolor. I mean, um, then um, what happened was this lady uh, who was a friend of my mom's saw one of my watercolors, or I guess my mom gave her a watercolor, and she called me up and she said, you know, the Philadelphia College of Art is having classes on uh, at night or something, and I think you should go and I'll pay for the first one. I'm like, all right, sure, that sounds like fun. So I started going at night, and then next thing you know, I, I decided to try that, and I enrolled, um, you know, full time. Uh, That's pretty remarkable, Neil. I love the notion that somebody like saw that spark and empowered you in that yeah, way. Yeah, my, my whole life's been kind of like that. I can remember my grandmother taking me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City when I was a little kid and standing in front of these paintings and, and pointing up and saying, you're going to be doing this someday. And I, do, I was just kind of like, what? I don't, I don't know about that, you know, but... And then here you are at Plein Air Easton, and the president of the Met is the one who's um, presenting you an award uh, for. Um, that's that's pretty crazy. That that is a pretty crazy um, uh, um, turnabout. So you found yourself in college and and majoring in illustration. In part, was that because you felt like that was um, that was the way an artist might be able to make money? Is that how you landed in illustration? Exactly. Yes, I was actually married at that point already. We you know I had gotten married. And I just thought, I, I'm not going to just be a painter, you know. Painters don't make any money, from what I could tell. <laughs> so I thought illustration is a way to paint, but, um, you know, make a living at it. So that's what I did. <clears throat> and I, I actually um, really enjoyed that. I mean, I, I did uh, some really fun jobs, and it was a challenge. Uh, you know, it, it was problem-solving. Um, what what was a fun job? What was a fun job you did? <clears throat> um, as an illustrator? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, let's see. I did when a, you say it was, they were really fun. National, I mean, um, Civil War Museum in Harrisburg. A mural? A mural, but it, it was actually a large painting. Uh, a three foot, um, uh, three foot by um, 14 foot painting, which they enlarged twice that size. So it was six feet by 28 feet on the wall of the museum. Um, I did a poster for the Philadelphia 76ers basketball team where I placed all the players in my illustration together from different eras as, as if they were one team. So it was like the, like the all-star of all-star 76ers yeah. teams. And it was made. It was like a poster, and they gave it out at the last game that was played at the Spectrum. And oh wow, that's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. So my painting was on the jumbotron, you know. <laughs> that's really cool. And, I, and they gave me front row seats. It was awesome. Awesome. Like, who were the? Who do you think they were? Do you even remember Do who they were? Doctor J. Doctor J. I, Moses, yes. As a matter of fact, Mo Moses I, Malone. Dr. Moses J. Malone. They they had a luncheon to unveil this painting. And they had a bunch of the players were there. I, and Dr. J was one of them. And I, I had a nice conversation with him. 
Do you know the players besides Dr. J? Uh, Moses Malone. Moses Malone. Moses Malone. Uh, uh, Maurice Cheeks. Maurice Cheeks. <laughs> oh, um, he's got three. He's got three. Uh, uh, not not Dawkins. 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 Uh, yeah, I think uh, Dawkins was on it too. The the fourth and then the fifth. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Uh, well, there was actually. The, I think there was like twelve different players or so. Twelve. Yeah. Yeah, the whole, the whole the, You know, it wasn't like uh, a team on the floor. They were sitting as if it was a team picture. This is the last Right, right, and you painted it. Um, I did children's books where my my um, my children were on the covers, you know. Like my son was Marvin Redpost, which was a book um, written by Lewis Sacker, who's a pretty well-known children's author. So my son had red hair and the character uh, Marvin Redpost had red hair. So my son was the model. I've done probably like 20 of those. And um, by the time I did the last one, my son who was 10 years old at the time when, when I started was in his 20s. So I, was nice. kinda, I love it. Kind of not using him for a model anymore, but I would take pictures of him and get, you know, neighborhood kids to pose and stuff. So, I mean, a lot of stuff like that that was a lot of fun. And then you went to painting. You went, well, it sounds like you had a great time doing that stuff. I mean, yeah. totally different from... Yeah, I mean, let's talk about the, the, transi the transition right. then okay. from, from well, illustrations to fine art. Yes. Um, I started showing more in galleries. Like, I always painted... Uh, even when I was illustrating, I was doing, still doing paintings on the side kind of thing. Um, but, and one of the big factors was the, um, uh, the, when computers came on the scene, they just killed a lot of that work that we were doing. Like illustration is not right. what it used to be, you know? Right. So um, I could just sort of see the, the writing on the wall. So I started, um, taking trips up to Maine and showing in galleries and just doing that. And that was kind of at first like a side thing. And so you're so casual about that though, Neil, like how does one just get to show in galleries? Yeah. Well, like you make it sound like you can just be like, Oh, um, Tim would like to go show in some galleries well, up in, up in Maine. Like yeah. how, how the heck do people do that? Like, well, how did you find well, yourself you getting to do that? And then, you know, like I, um, I traveled up there with uh, a number of paintings and to this gallery that was in the area where I like to paint around. It was in uh, South Thomason, which is near Rockland. And I just approached them and I said, I'd like to show you some of my work. They saw it and they were like, yeah, we'll take it. So, I mean, um, you know, I had skills from being an illustrator that I applied to painting, um, the, the coastals and the, the boats up in Maine, the, the, the schooners and all that. So I had a body of work that, uh, you know, was, I guess, saleable. And um, so that's that's sort of what got me started. Then I, I started showing it. But is that your advice then? Like just show up with your paintings and hope for the best? Um, well, I contacted them. I probably emailed them images. I, I don't really remember back then because... In the beginning, a lot of places were still taking slides, you know, and that kind of thing. But, right. um, sure. you know, they, they were happy to meet with me. And mm -hmm. um, actually, a friend of mine had an airplane, and he gave me a ride up there because there's a little airport in Owlshead. I love it. Owlshead, Maine, which is right, you know, like maybe a mile and a half from the gallery. So I took him up on his plane. And went in. So 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 to the first listeners, class right away. Right, for, so for the <laughs> listeners, it's really easy to get in galleries. Yeah. Just get your friend who has an airplane to take all of the beautiful paintings you've already created, and show up at the gallery, and then they'll just say, "This is terrific. We'd love to take your paintings." That's, right. <laughs> That's all there is to it. Yeah. I um, love it. I love yes, it. Yes, and I and I started expanding from that. I started showing at uh, Mystic Seaport. They had uh, th that gallery. Unfortunately, was closed. Um, during the pandemic, but Aww. for years they had a, a wonderful gallery there. And I, you know, if you get into their international show, then they will show your work at the gallery also. So I, you know, I did uh, happen to do that. 
And I got into other galleries, too. And I just slowly just started um, letting that, you know, dominate what I was doing. Um, I still was doing some illustration jobs, you know, for quite a few years, kind of back and forth, did some graphic design, uh, stuff on computers because, you know, I still needed to make a living. Because all through this, you know, I, I raised a family. I had four, four children. And um, <clears throat> so that was always an issue with me. You know, I, I couldn't just not make money. Um, right. So, um, yeah, it, it, it all worked out. I pray a lot. Too. If you're in this business, you got to pray a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that, too. So when you're when you're talking about these paintings that you are bringing up to Maine and you're you're, you're talking, you know, about how you, even in your illustration, it sounds like plein air has always been kind of a part of that, that you're somebody who's painting from life. You're not painting much from your imagination. Would you say that that's true? Uh, I mean, you're painting. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Right? Although um, I, I also painted from photographs that I would I would go mm -hmm. on trips up to Maine and, and take photographs. Although lately, like most of my work is just done either on location or from work that I did on location. Like if I do a lot, you know, some of my larger paintings, uh, most of the time are done from smaller paintings. So from studies, uh, right. I, I have got to the point um, where uh, part of the thing for me is the experience. You know, it's not just uh, cranking out another painting. It's, it's going places and seeing things and, you know, painting uh, from life is very important to me. It's, it, it just makes it so much more fun. And I think it makes it uh, better work. You know, it's a total. So there's, so there's this like plein air movement that they talk about. And there certainly has been in the last 20 years, I think an explosion of plein air competitions and festivals. And like, were you really like prior to that time, were you really doing a lot? Like, tell me about your, your kind of, um, connection to the the plein air movement and this community because you're certainly someone who does a whole lot of events every year yes uh well i was doing plein air like at mystic seaport had a thing where uh they would have a week where artists would come up and paint and when i would go on trips i would try to paint you know also um but i guess um I, when i really started getting into it is when these events started happening and I started doing a lot of events because you know you travel from place to place and you paint and I mean there's just nothing like it I mean it's just like it was like a whole new world you know opened up to me in terms of you know I'm painting um in Easton one week and then uh you know in Richmond Virginia um uh Cape Ann and the Rocky Mountains, Texas, you know, all these places that I normally probably would have not have traveled to to paint. Uh, right. you know, it gave me these opportunities to, to paint at all these wonderful places. Um, although, you know, I mean, um, I did travel up to Maine, as I said, and um, I would paint like places like Mystic Seaport. And, you know, there's a lot, uh, a lot I would have been doing, but just doing these events just just gave me a lot more opportunities, you know. And so what percentage of your work in in a, in a in a normal 12 months, and I sort of understand that we have not just experienced a normal 12 months. Yes. But how much of your, your sort of painting inventory in a year comes from participation in one of these events? Uh, that's a good question. Um how many paintings or what percent? Like just kind of what, yeah, what percentage? I mean, again, I think that, you know, there are some people who say, who, I mean, there, there are a lot of different artists who participate in the sort of circuit, right? And there yeah. are some who say, oh, I only do like two or three events a year. Right. And like, I don't really see that as being what you do. You do events that are big. You do events that are small. You like, yeah. I think that you, uh, even from what I'm hearing from you, you use those events to inspire and um, connect to your work. Yeah. So, you know, you really like you really do a lot of events every year, Neil. Maybe you don't realize how many you do, but you do a lot more than a well, lot of the people that we talked to. Most I've done, I think, was 12 one year. And, and that was that was a lot. Yeah, that's a crazy amount of events to go. Yes, to. It, it is. And um, 
But I would say uh, probably 95% of my paintings are done plein air, but they're not always at an event. Um, I, I just had a show um, that opened a few weeks ago, and I think I had 20 paintings, and uh, 18 of them were plein air. Two were, were studies. One of the studies was done from a plein air, and the other one was uh, an older painting that um, I had done from a photograph. So, I mean, it's like most of my work is plein air. Uh, I would say probably at least 60 or 70 percent is done at events because, um, you know, it takes a long time to prepare for an event. But while you're at the event, all you're doing is painting. So, you you know, I'll do like eight paintings, uh, maybe up to 10 paintings in a week at an event. So, no, uh, the, what the listeners d didn't get to hear is before we um, went live on the on the this podcast, Neil was bemoaning how much office work he has, and I, you know, we made the comment that um, I don't think people realize how much back office work every a, a professional artist has to do in terms of connecting with galleries, the financial piece, even just the packing and shipping and ordering of all of those things. And you're right, when you are at an event, you have like really crossed out that time on your calendar right. to do nothing but paint. Yeah, I, that's why one of the reasons I love doing events because I get up early, I, I start paint, I paint all day, you know, I, and, you know, I'm really kind of focused on my painting. Like I know there are artists who are a little more casual about it, but I, I really want to paint. I don't know. There's just I, like it's kind of like my competitive nature or something. It's like I get this adrenaline when I'm at events that I don't have normally. I mean, I you know I I spent a week up in Maine this summer and painted, and I got a lot of work done. But um, it wasn't like this intense feeling as I'm painting. You know, <laughs> it was a little more relaxed. That's cool. So. I think you're the first person that we've talked to that's actually said that. That's very interesting. And, um, yeah, I, I, suspect, I suspect, Neil, though, also, too, if you're going out to 10, 12 events a year, that you you, you like the rush and you like the what it creates in, in your, you know, how it makes you feel painting it. But do you pretty much expect to sell something every time you go somewhere? And, and you know, um, is that part of the equation as well? Well, you have to, uh, if you're going to keep doing it, uh, you have to, uh, either win money or sell or both. Um, and I guess it's very rare that I have an event where I don't sell anything, although it has happened. Um, I always go into it where I'm not really focused on that or worried about it, but it is important, you know, to do that. And, uh, you know, I've been pretty lucky lately. I've been, you know, um, selling pretty well at the events. Some of my paintings tend to be higher priced uh, just because, um, I, I don't know, because I, I paint bigger usually than most people. And I just uh, have it in my mind that, you know, most of the paintings I do, I could just turn around and sell them in a gallery if they don't sell at the event. So I'm not going to like go in there and try to compete with people who are not charging enough, you know, or um, because. Well, and let's be let's let's be clear, Neil, like you have the experience and have been a professional artist for a long time. You have built your brand and your work re re reflects that. I mean, so it's not it's not as simple as like, oh, I paint bigger. And so my my price point should be higher. Like your price point is in, in, informed by all of those years in galleries and your education and your experience being an illustrator. Whereas if you're somebody and this is your first event and you are not represented by a gallery and you are, they could paint a painting that's twice the size of yours and it doesn't mean that it should demand the same price. Oh, point. absolutely. No, your, your brand, yes. your brand is really important right. to, to informing the, those dollars. I think. Absolutely. Um, that's, a, you know, a huge part of it uh, also is, um, you know, you, you get to a point where you're charging certain things at galleries. You can't just turn around and, cut that in half because you're because somebody else is you know charging less I mean it just doesn't make any sense to me the other thing is there are some people that do events who they're not really uh, uh, in business you know like I'm in business like I have to look right. at it as a business and I have to know what I need to charge to make a profit all that 
or it's not worth my time, you know. Uh, I could still turn around and just do gallery paintings, uh, but I really love doing the event, so I, I just figure out what I need to do, and that's what I do. And, and I have sold um, most of the paintings I've done at events um, that didn't sell have been sold, you know, in galleries. Sometimes it takes a while, but eventually they, they sell, you know. So there's right. no reason to um, uh, cut the prices down or anything. It looks like he's talking to us from his studio. Are you in your studio in right now? Studio, is this, yes. Is your studio inside your house? It is. Yes, it is now. I, I moved about two years ago. For uh, over 20 years, I rented space above a hardware store in the town where I used to live. And then uh, two years ago, I decided it's time to move it home. So we we uh, we looked for another house and bought a nice house in Medford, New Jersey. And I love it the way it is now. I mean, I thought yeah. my commute was bad, you know, traveling five blocks before. <laughs> now I just come downstairs, you know. It's not bad. Perfect. Yeah. I don't know. I find it. I'm a. I'm terrible at working at home. I get way too distracted. I yeah. really do need to. I really do need to get out of the house and come to the office to be productive. Right. I just it really. I, I think that the pe people who work from home or have studios at home, I think, need to have a certain level of discipline that I somehow don't have. Yeah, um, I could see how that would you know be a problem. But usually, I overbook myself for you know. Uh, I have obligations, like I'll tell a gallery, yeah, I'll have <laughs> 10 paintings for you, and then I have to come up with them, so I'm always, I feel like I'm always rushing to get things done, because uh, there's not enough time in the day, you know? Um, Neil, do you do a lot of teaching and workshops, or is that not really something that you enjoy doing? Like, I know you have done demonstrations, yes. but like, what, are, are you called to, to provide, like... Tell me about how you relate to teaching and whether it's something that you like or don't like. Uh, or, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy, you know, uh, interacting with people. Um, I teach workshops through um, <clears throat> the Wayne Art Center in Pennsylvania. Yep. Uh, of course. Medford Arts, which is my hometown here. I'm going to be teaching a workshop in um, Tequesta, Florida in March. Um before the lighthouse plain air event. So yes, I, I mean, I do workshops. Um, I have a video, you know, on my website. So I, sometimes people, you know, want to know my, my process and I tell them, go buy my video, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, love that. So, I love it. Um, and I, I do enjoy it, but I, I can't be one of these people who does that all, you know, that's like their main focus. It doesn't feed you that way. You yeah, like my, to paint. You're a painter. My main you focus paint. is painting. And I, I, I enjoy sharing it uh, with people, but um, not, you know, the, I don't want that to be my my career, you know. Have you ever um, reached a, a, a time period or when you do reach a time period where you just feel creatively drained, like you don't? Or do you ever find yourself in a place where you just are stuck? You're just like, I, I just don't know what to paint. I don't like what I'm painting. Like, has that ever happened to you or are you just well, sort of bulletproof? Not real. I mean, not lately, not in the past <laughs> 15, 20 years. I, I usually have all these ideas of things I want to paint and I don't get around to them, you know, like, cause I, you know, if you do these events, you end up seeing all these great things you want to paint. And so you do. And um, usually there's a few ideas I have that uh, I never get around to doing. Um, and when I'm, when I'm in my studio, I usually have like things I kind of work on. It might not be um, um, the subject that it, it might be like, I want to work on trying to use, um, you know, a, a higher key palette or something like that. I'll just experiment. And there's always things that um, I want to do that, you know, that I sometimes never get around to doing. And I, I don't ever remember a time lately that where I felt like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do next or anything like that. No. A lot of times, uh, if I'm just painting, say, in my studio, I got paintings piled up all over the place. And yeah, sometimes I feel like um, 
you know, some are better than others or whatever, but um, I'm not sure that I ever feel like, oh yeah, that was a home, you know, that's the best painting I've ever did or anything like that. It's more of like, um, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm creating this body of work and some are going to be better, some are going to be worse, you know, and um, you just keep trying to uh, focus on the ones that are better and, and just try to keep getting better, you know, but. Do you feel like your style has changed a lot or can you identify a time when you you decided to make a change or do you just think you keep getting better at being Neil Hughes? Well, I'm always um, experimenting and trying different things and I definitely my uh, my approach has changed, um, especially doing these plein air events and painting with other artists has really uh, helped me to grow, I think. And yes, I can, I notice a definite difference. If I look at a painting I did 15 years ago and what I'm doing now, it's definitely different. And um, now uh, there, you know, there's good things you could find about the paintings I did 15 years ago, I guess. Um, but I really like what I'm doing now. Like, I feel like I'm a better painter than I was then. Um, uh, one thing is, um, I used to, I used to spend maybe a week sometimes on a 16 by 20 and it'd be very detailed. And, you know, I enjoyed doing it and everything, but, um, you know, when you do these events, you can't spend that much time on a painting. So I had to get faster and you had, you really have to learn how to paint and to get it down and to make it work in a short period of time, which allows you to do more paintings. And, um, um, yes, I mean, the way I'm, um, applying the paint, everything is, is totally different than the way I used to do it. And I think it's a change for the better. Um, I've learned so much from, um, you know, uh, painting with others because there's some darn good artists doing these events, you know, and yeah, there are. I've been very lucky to, you know, hang out with them and paint with them and stuff. And, um, you know, in the beginning when I started doing these events, I can remember being very surprised because um, I always needed a certain something to do a painting and I would walk by things and think, well, there's no paintings there. And then you would see how someone else would do a beautiful painting and you'd be like, oh, I think I'm missing something here, you know. So it really helps you to um, uh, learn to see things differently and try different approaches. I, I'm i always open to trying new tools, new brushes, um, trying um, uh, different uh, ways of painting. Uh, I also read, you know, books and things on painting sometimes and you pick up things. And so, yes, it's been like a journey and I feel like, um, like I, I, I still feel like I'm growing as an, as an artist. And to me, that's very important. Also, if I ever get to the point where I'm just doing the same thing over and over again, I don't think I could do it because I would just be too bored. I, I have to right. always be, uh, reaching out for uh, something new, you know. To when you're when you're choosing what you paint, when you're when you're saying you're walking by these scenes and you're saying, eh, I just don't see anything to paint here. How much of your brain is looking for what inspires you, and how much is trying to calculate things like saleability of that painting? I mean, like I appreciate yeah. how pragmatic you are about this is your job, and it's a business, and yeah. you got to make sure that you are creating saleable content. You know, if you bring bring your gallery up in in main you know paintings of the dump they might be like neil you're crazy we really need boats and rocks you know like yeah. i think yeah. that um what is that balance like in uh, your head when you're looking yeah, around for something to paint um actually the things that are uh the most saleable are usually the things that i am dying to paint like <laughs> that you're called to anyway yeah i'm seeing something and i'm like oh that would be awesome painting you know whatever it is about it, um, that grabs me. So, um, <clears throat> you know, that I don't, I don't go out and I say, all right, what, what, what around here would sell? That's what I'm going to, it doesn't really work like that. Like I, ha if I'm excited about something, it's going to be a better painting and the right. better paintings are the ones that sell the quickest usually. So, um, 
Now, there, I mean, there are certain subjects maybe I would avoid painting because I know it's not going to sell, but very few. I mean, usually it's um, uh, I just have certain things that I like to do and uh, they seem to work, you know. Uh, I'm very, I love to do architecture or boats and, you know, things with structure. Um, I love doing figures. I don't, I don't do enough of those during plein air events usually, but, um, uh, I, I, as an illustrator, I did that quite a bit and I, I, I am, I do try to do that, um, for some of my more personal works, you know. Neil, do you have a favorite painter outside of living, living painter, outside of plein air Ooh. that is not shapes and landscapes and that sort of thing? Yeah. A favorite living painter. I. Who's going to be famous for like being the next whoever or whatever? You know what I mean? In the abstract world or or. Uh, Do you have somebody that you look up to in that way? or, or uh... I mean, there's a lot of artists whose work I admire. I can't say, you know, one person comes to mind that, yeah, you know, that they're like the best or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've always followed uh, like the Wyeths. Uh, where I live, I'm not, you know, I went to the Philadelphia College of Art, so we're very close to Chadsford, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. You know, that whole tradition um, was very important to me. It still is. So, yeah, I, I appreciate artists like Jamie Wyeth. Now, he does some stuff that's a little wacky, too, so I, I can't say I, you know, I love everything he does or anything like that. Um I was just curious. You, you just seem to be so in, 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 you know, you're just such a, you're painting all the time and you're reading books and you're like, and I just didn't know if it went beyond landscapes or boats right. to like abstract. Oh, or yeah, no, I'm not really into abstract. Contemporary. Art. He likes pretty um, things. Not, not pure abstract. You know, personally, it doesn't really interest me. I, to me, I like the, the uh, process of um, painting something representational that works in an abstract manner uh, as well, like to to uh, bring those two things together. Uh, every really successful painting, I think, um, you know, the, the design elements and everything have to work. And uh, that has to do with abstraction and, you know, how it's put together. But it, in terms of just throwing paint and that kind of thing, it doesn't really interest me. I've always been more on um, the traditional side. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of artists I could tell you who I don't like. <laughs> who, who don't you like? No, tell me no, one person. You, <laughs> tell me one person you don't like. No, I, no don't. I don't do it. Um, I actually appreciate all that. It just doesn't interest me. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, yeah, no, I, uh, that's a yeah. great answer. Right. Um, one of the things that I remember about Neil from years ago, and again, I, I do think he's got that competitive spark, but what do you do to get yourself prepared for y your festival circuit? Or if you know that you're like, the weather is warming up. I'm going to be hitting the road. Yeah. Like what kinds of things do you do to get ready? Because it can be really grueling. And if you're at Plenary Easton, it's really hot. Yes. Well, I'll tell you, I actually train. <laughs> I know. I know this about you. I was That was a leading question, but I wasn't sure if you still did it because we haven't talked I about run, it in a while. I try to run like four or five days a week. And I, I run for about 35 minutes lately. So, I'm you know, I'm doing over three miles. And... I mean, that's just not just uh, to get prepared for playing Air Easton, which it... it oh, come really, on. I like it when you say it that. It really helps, I must say. Like, if you run in the humidity and stuff, then it's not a shock to your system to go out and paint, you know? Um, but, yeah, no, I actually uh, do try to take care of myself physically. Um, I've actually run into a few roadblocks the past uh, year. I, I think I might have had COVID, like when I was down in Florida. I got this sinus thing and then it 
turned into asthma. So you... some people did have like that. There was that, that was like right. That Florida event was like the week everything shut down. It was, right? Yeah. There were three or four artists that I was in direct contact that with. Got sick. Who had COVID. So I, I don't really know if I had it, but it really messed me up. Like I had to um, uh, go to the doctor to get medications just to be able to run and stuff, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. now I'm, I'm back where I'm running again. But no, I, I do try to uh, prepare, um, not just physically, but I try to, you know, keep painting because you have to be kind of in a groove almost um, painting wise to, to, to be successful at this. So I try to paint all the time as much as I can. But as we, we talked about earlier, there, there are so many other things you have to do. It, it's probably... Um, you know, takes up 50% of my time doing other things other than the actual painting. Um. <clears throat> I know people don't really realize that. So like, I don't want to get you in trouble here, but I guess I, I would ask you the question because you are somebody who paints so much on location and, and from life. At what percentage of a painting needs to be done on site to be considered plein air in your opinion? Oh, um, well, I mean, I most of the time will do the entire painting, even if it's just um, something I'm doing on my own. But uh, I would say probably at least 80, 85 percent. I mean, it, the idea if it's if you're going to consider it plain air it means you painted it there and maybe even 90 or 95 percent because. You know, you can bring it back in the studio and touch it up. There's always things like yeah, like when you bring when you bring things home and you look at it like back in the studio. Yes. How how often are you like, oh, I got to go back out there to the site because this tree just is wrong versus this tree is just wrong. I need to sit here and try to figure right, out how to fix right. it. Well, I try to plan it so that I don't have to do that. Um, like if I'm doing a large painting, I will maybe go back. Um, you know two or three times um, <clears throat> or spend two or three sessions for a, a really large painting. But most of my smaller ones, I just, you know, I do what I need to do and um, uh, I complete them uh, on site. Now, when I first started doing this, I would spend a lot more time. Maybe when I would get home, I would work on paintings a little longer. <laughs> But um, I, I've kind of developed a way of just uh, finishing them. And uh, most of them do not need anything, really. I mean, uh, occasionally, you know, I'll notice something that I didn't notice when I was there. But uh, most of the time, they're actually better if you finish them on site because uh, once the paint's completely dry and everything, if you're going to redo an area, you got to kind of redo the whole thing to get it looking the way I want it. Um, so I, cause there's a lot of things I can do while the paint is still wet that I can't do later on. So I try to do it all, um, uh, at once. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And where, where are you headed next? If people like you, you've got, you told me you're headed to, was uh, it Bath? Yes, where are you going? Virginia, yes. That's the next competition. And does that start rounding out your, the competition season for you? Or do you have more on your docket? Uh, and then Cape Ann after that, and that'll be it for this year. Yeah. And then it's back in the studio. Yes. Um, I have a show coming up in Florida. Uh, so I have to get some paintings ready for that. <clears throat> um, and I have, you know, I have sometimes I'll work on commissions. I'm, I'm working on a commission right now also. Awesome. So I have plenty to keep me busy. Um, and I then love I'll it. be doing um my next event after that, after Cape Ann, will be in Florida in uh, uh, March. So The springtime. Yeah. Right, right, right. Neil, it's always good to talk to you. I certainly hope that um, part of your office work this year will be applying to Plein Air East and when the oh, prospectus absolutely. Yes. drops. Um, we always love to see you. It's been, it's been fun seeing, seeing your face, not during July. And um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you today. Oh, I, I always yeah. appreciate my yeah. time with you. And I, I didn't really feel like I got to see you a lot this year for some reason. So I'm glad we got a little bit of time to talk absolutely. today. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it uh, thoroughly. Thank you, uh, Jess and Tim uh, and Nick. Uh, <laughs> yes. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Neil.
Plan Air Easton podcast is brought to you by the Avalon Foundation, enriching the lives of those on the eastern shore of Maryland through the arts. Visit avalonfoundation.org for details on events, performances, and educational programming offered throughout the year. The Plan Air Easton podcast is produced by Nick Richards. Our theme music was generously provided by Blue Dot Sessions. Remember to rate, comment, and subscribe. You can learn more about Plan Air Easton at planairisten.com. <laughs>